Hello, this is CJ Hoyle. Today is Sunday, February the 6th, 2022, and today I'm gonna to go cross-country skiing at Tommy Thompson Park here in Toronto. All right, so beginning from the Leslie Street entrance, I begin my way heading out onto the Leslie Street Spit, which is where Tommy Thompson Park is located here in the city of Toronto. This is a man-made land formation, which was created using a lot of discarded materials from construction starting as early as the 1950s. This is a man-made peninsula that sticks out from the shore of Lake Ontario in the city of Toronto, about five kilometers. And my plan for this video is that I'm going to cross-country ski all the way from the entrance out to the tip of the peninsula, which is where there's a small lighthouse. And you can see that I'm not the only person who's been skiing here. I've got some nice tracks to follow. So right now I'm heading in the south direction, which means that the sun is kind of straight ahead of me, but eventually I'll be kind of curving to the right, so The sun will not be in frame for the whole video. And it's a fairly windy day today. And I've always said when there are days where there's wind present, you're definitely gonna feel it if you go out on the Leslie Street Spit. And that's because basically it's this, you know, land formation that jets out into this big lake. And there aren't an awful lot of big trees and there's certainly, you know, no buildings or very few buildings that are built out here. So it's not very protected. So any wind coming off the lake you're gonna feel. But nevertheless, I decided to come here today. I was cross country skiing yesterday in a golf course at the Don Valley, not the Don Valley, at the Rosedale Golf Club, which I filmed a video of, and I really enjoyed being out and doing that. And I was sort of looking at other places that I might want to go. And this is one of the places called out on the city's website as a place that they sort of recommend people to go for cross-country skiing. So having never done this before, I decided that, all right, I'll go. Even though, like I said, it's windy, which is probably not the best day to be here. I, I'm, in fact, if I could do it over, I probably would have come here yesterday and gone to the golf course today. But anytime that we have snow in Toronto, it's I sort of feel like it's a, a gift that you never know how long it's gonna stick around for. So if I didn't come today, there's a chance that I might have not been able to come here at all this winter. And, and yeah, I've never, never cross country skied here before, although I have done bike rides here. Uh, dozens of times I've come with my bike and ridden out to the end of this peninsula. And here is sort of the second gate to get in. There's another pathway which leads to here from kind of over to the right of where I am right now. And I, I think this thing straight ahead is a, well, it's, it looks kind of like a way scale. I'm not sure whether it actually is, but basically they still do some 
operations here with respect to the disposal of materials. Certainly not an awful, not an awful lot of stuff gets dumped here anymore, but this place is actually only open as a park on weekdays after 4 p.m. in the evening. And that's because of those operations that are going on here. Definitely feel that wind against me. So this part of the spit is very narrow. It's called the neck of the spit. But once we get past the neck, things sort of widen out and there's kind of two different pathways that you can take. And in the middle of them, there's some lagoons. I was talking to some other cross country skiers as I was coming in and they were telling me that the bridge here that's on one of those two paths is open, which it isn't always, and at least during the summertime it's often closed. So I was glad to hear that because that's the shorter of the two routes to get to the lighthouse and probably what I'm going to take. Over there on the right, there's a set of docks that belong to the outer harbor. Which is sort of like a marina or a yacht club where lots of pleasure craft boats get docked. Although this time of the year you can see that those docks are like completely empty and the boats have the boats are up on the land wrapped up in plastic to protect them from the damage of the ice forming around them in the winter and the fact that nobody's using them at this time of the year And yeah, so this land formation was, like I said, they started building it back in the 1950s. And at that time, the Toronto Harbor was a very industrial place where there was lots of boats coming and going all the time, delivering things, picking up things. And I think that the, the natural harbor that's here in Toronto that was, you know, naturally created by the Toronto Island, which shelters the waterfront. That main harbor was getting close to capacity and they thought that as the city continued to grow and continued to play a big role in the, the shipping industry and the Great Lakes, they thought that they would need somewhere to go once they run out of, ran out of space in there. So they made this big peninsula to shelter another section of the waterfront, which is called the Outer Harbor. So the original harbor is now the Inner Harbor, and this is the, the Outer Harbor that's over here to the right of me. Here you can see somebody riding a bike in the other direction. So to construct this, they used a lot of materials that would otherwise have been waste. They used a lot of dirt that came out of the tunnels when they were building the subways, as well as a lot of dirt that got excavated when they were building tall buildings as well. And sort of the outer, the outer parts of it where, you know, the 
the water from the waves sort of splashes, you know, splashes on the peninsula. A lot of that material that you'll see there is old demolished concrete from old sidewalks and old buildings. Which, you know, essentially works the same as rocks would do if there were naturally rocks there. Although, the main difference is that the old concrete has metal rebar inside of it, which is not very aesthetically pleasing, but also not very safe for things like swimming. Let me just pan the camera over here to the right so you can see. There's the Toronto skyline with that marina over there straight ahead and that big stack is from the old Hearn generating station, which was a large coal-fired coal power plant that hasn't operated in Toronto for a really long time and situated very close to the downtown core of such a large city, it was really not a good thing to install there because it really had a very poor impact on the uh, air quality as coal power plants do. Some other skiers over there on the left passing me. Yeah, despite being here lots of times on my bike, I've never skied this roadway or this trail before. Part of the reason is because when I'm looking for places to go skiing, and this one comes up in the list, I always think, well, that would be really flat because being that it's a man-made portion of land, you know, there's no incentive for it to get any hills in it. It's really just built at a pretty uniform elevation above the water. But it's a really unique place. Despite its industrial past and present, this is actually a very protected nature reserve or conservation area. And kind of as the story goes, you know, they, they built this land out here as, you know, sort of as a break wall to protect that outer harbor we were talking about. And there weren't any pl plants or animals or anything you know, placed here. You know, it wasn't intended for them to sort of come, but they just sort of came on their own. And there's quite a large nature population that lives here. I watched a documentary Not that long ago, it came out in 2020, February, so I guess it's about two years old, but I watched it maybe a year ago. And it's The Nature of Things, which is a CBC program hosted by David Suzuki. And it's, you know, it's a show where they go around the world and they're looking at all kinds of interesting animals that are all over the world, but they devoted an entire episode to talking about Tommy Thompson Park here. And I found it extremely interesting and I learned so many things that I never knew before that I just found fascinating. It's actually, this documentary is actually on YouTube. It's only 45 minutes long. And I'll put a link in the description. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, I learned things like the fact that there are coyotes that live you know, here at Tommy Thompson Park, but 
they go further than just telling you that. For example, they, they taught us that coyotes are actually a relatively new species that have sort of moved to this part of the world. If we were to go back, you know, a hundred years or so, maybe a little bit more than a hundred years, but you'd find this area didn't have any coyotes and the dominant large canine species was wolves. And the reason why the wolves left and the coyotes moved in was because this area used to be, I mean, not specifically here, but this part of Ontario used to be covered in trees. And forests are where wolves thrive, where coyotes are a, a grassland sort of creature that come from the prairies. So the coyotes that are here are actually called Eastern coyotes, which are a hybrid species that are half Western coyote from the prairies and wolf. So even though we called them coyotes, they're actually sort of a crossbreed between wolves and coyotes. So back there I passed a turn where I could have gone left and that would have taken me to the other trail that leads to the peninsula to the end. But I've taken this option which like I said is a little bit shorter and it'll allow me to go across a bridge which I think will be a bit more interesting. Should also be a little bit more sheltered because I'm getting away from the, the shoreline which is to my left. see a couple of vehicles driving down up ahead. This is not an area where, you know, people can just drive their private vehicles. This is only for, I guess, conservation staff or perhaps police as well. Yeah, and that vehicle has a sticker on the front which says Toronto and Region Conservation Area, or Conservation Authority. I'm just gonna switch over to this trail that's over here to my left. I think that should be a little bit better for skiing on. So yeah, not an awful lot of tall trees here in this park, but in the summer, this area where I'm skiing right now and sort of all of the ditches along the trails are just full of all kinds of plants that are growing. Just short little, you know, wildflowers and weeds and things, but it's a very green place to come. Another thing that Tommy Thompson Park is sort of famous for or known for is the colony of cormorants that live here. Cormorants are a migrational bird which spend their summer in the Great Lakes and I guess other places too. And Tommy Thompson Park is home to North America's largest colony of cormorants. And a lot of people don't like cormorants and sort of the, the history behind them is that they're a, a bird that, you know, has lived in the Great Lakes for 
you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. But they were a bird, I believe, that was badly impacted by pesticides. Pesticides that were used, you know, within the 1900s, like DDT. So they were, you know, greatly diminished in population and probably close to extinction. But then once those chemicals stopped being used, the population has rebounded again. So lots of people that grew up in these areas and, you know, never saw a cormorant are now, they're seeing them all over the place. And sort of, a lot of people don't like them. And I guess, you know, they mistakenly think that they're sort of an invasive species because the population has exploded so much, but that's not the case. And another thing that they sort of have going against them is that when they nest in trees or really anywhere, their organic waste that comes out of them is very acidic and it destroys most of the vegetation that surrounds them. So if they, you know, they make a nest in a tree, the tree may have started out as a healthy tree with all kinds of leaves on it and everything, but within a short period of time, that becomes a dead tree that's just sort of a gray color with no leaves on it anymore. But in this documentary, they sort of show the, what I think is rather ingenious solution that they have for helping to control the cormorant population, or at least to control their destruction of the trees here, because like I said, there's not a lot of trees here to begin with. And you know, there's, not, there's really no big trees, so getting trees knocked off all the time by cormorants is not a, not a good thing, but. Like I said, if you're interested in this stuff, this documentary will be right up your alley. It's really well put together. So the temperature right now is about, I think zero degrees Celsius, maybe a little bit colder. I think it was negative four when I woke up with a high of zero expected, but it is very windy. But of course I was sure to dress appropriately for the weather. And yeah, despite this being quite flat, uh, I'm quite impressed with skiing here. It's especially nice that so many other skiers have been here ahead of me making these, you know, well compacted tracks. They're not icy or anything. They're, they're quite, quite smooth and I'm, you know, able to get a sufficient amount of grip with my waxless cross country skis. I'm just about at the bridge now, and this bridge is necessary because that water that's over there to my left, that's a, a large bay that was sort of left over in the middle of the spit, and they allow boats to go in there. I think mostly it's for small sailboats for sort of learning how to sail. So to be able to get in there, they have this bridge, which is actually a, a floating pontoon bridge that they're able to sort of unchain and move out of the way so that boats are able to come and go as they please. So some of the time you can cross this bridge, but other times you can't. And for the times when you can't cross the bridge, you can take the other pathway that I was describing earlier that was over to my left. 
Now I do believe that I'll have to take my skis off to walk across this bridge because there probably won't be any snow on it right now. So there you can see that bridge straight ahead and some open water. And I gotta be careful skiing down here that I can stop in time and not ending up in that water. So I'm sure it would be very cold right now. All right, I'm gonna take my skis off and I'll pick things back up over there. So those birds that you can see over there are swans and the two that are on the left are trumpeter swans. And the one that's closer to me with the orange beak is a mute swan. Swans were another species that they talked about in that documentary. The trumpeter swan is one of the native swan species that is from this area of the world. And similar to the cormorants, they nearly went extinct. But they've been making a comeback thanks to a lot of conservation efforts. A lot of the trumpeter swans you'll see have yellow tags on them. And that's because they're monitoring the, the numbers and sort of the migration patterns and things like that. But those two there I saw didn't have any tags, which is a, a good sign. It means that they were probably born in, well, I'm sure they were born, you know, naturally here. The mute swans, on the other hand, are not of native species. They were brought over from Europe and they were sort of a bird that was sort of put in, put in parks to sort of make parks a, a nice place. The way to be able to differentiate them, or at least the, the simple way to differentiate them is by looking at the color of their beak. The mute swans have an orange beak where the trumpeters have a a black beak, although if you're looking at younger swans, ones that have not fully turned to their white color, or in other words the ugly ducklings, that beak color theory does not hold true. And there's also another species of swan in Ontario called the tundra swan, which also typically have black colored beaks. Yeah, this is the, the most like well-worn cross-country skiing trails that I've seen so far this winter, you know, that are naturally created. This is just so consistent. Nobody's come and ruined these trails. I guess maybe part of the reason is because this is such a wide roadway that people driving cars and people riding bikes and people walking or snowshoeing have sort of found their own way. So like I said, my plan is to ski all the way out to the end of the peninsula to where the lighthouse is, but there's a chance that the battery on this camera may not last the entire way there, but I'll do my best to make it that far. Yeah, so sort of over here to the right is where the cormorants normally live here in the summer. They are a migrational bird though that spend their winters somewhere else. And there's quite a lot of birds that sort of spend their summers here. It is a great place to come if you're into bird watching. Although there's kind of a misconception that there's not much to see here in the winter because all the birds go away. But interestingly, 
Just like how there are birds that migrate from here south in the winter to find warmer climates, there are also migrational birds that live even further north. They come and spend their winters here in the more temperate winters in places like Toronto. For example, there's a species of duck called the long-tailed duck, which you'll see around these parts. I know back in the, in the spring when I first got my kayak last year, I went kayaking in late April, early May, and I saw all these unusual ducks and other birds in the water that I had never seen before. I took some photos of them and I looked them up and I learned that, yeah, those are, well, long-tailed ducks are one of the species that I was seeing and they spend their winters up in the Arctic or they spend their summers up in the Arctic, including places like Greenland. And then when it gets too cold for them up there and the in the really cold weather, they come down here and they get to experience this not so cold winter here in Toronto. Well, my perfect cross country ski tracks have kind of disappeared. I think maybe this track might be the best of the three to pick from. Guess I spoke too soon. There is another parallel route from here on which leads to the lighthouse, which kind of follows the outer shore next to the water, but that would be, you know, narrower and probably possibly more scenic, but it would also be a lot windier right now, so I think I've picked the right route. When I was coming in, when I was talking to the other cross-country skiers to try and learn a little bit more, and I said, how was it? And they said, oh, it's, you know, pretty good. And then they said, it's gonna be pretty windy when you go out there, but the way back is gonna be nice because you'll have the wind behind you. So I have that to look forward to when I turn around and come back after I finish making this video. After hearing that, of course, I was considering that maybe I would film the way back as opposed to filming the way there, but I think this is better anyways because it sort of gives you my first impression of what it's like skiing here at Tommy Thompson Park for my very first time. Speaking of my kayak, I, I mentioned that I've come bike riding here at Tommy Thompson Park, you know, several dozen times in the warmer months. But the other method of transportation that I've sort of used to experience this park prior to cross-country skiing today was in my kayak. I never started kayaking from here, but I, on more than one occasion, I started from Cherry Beach, which is over on the other side of that outer harbor that I was talking about. And I kayaked across to here and I sort of followed along the shoreline of it to sort of see it from the water, and I got to appreciate some good nature sightings, including lots of minks that live in those concrete and rebar shoreline aspects that I was talking about. When I got my kayak, I really envisioned that I wanted to see as much of the Toronto waterfront as I possibly could, so I sort of sort of made a, a plan of trying to basically color in on the map the entire shoreline from kind of end to end. So what that means is, you know, using my, my GPS or my, my smartphone app, I would record every time that I went kayaking and then I would plot them all on a map and I would keep track of, okay, what parts of the shoreline have I not seen yet? and I would gradually fill in those gaps. And Tommy Thompson Park being a, 
you know, a five kilometer peninsula that sticks out, but you know, there's a fair amount of territory to cover there. Uh, but what sort of amplifies that is that the sides of this peninsula are not straight. They're not, you know, a long straight beach or anything like that. They're all curvy with all kinds of things jutting out for them because again, their whole idea was to try and protect the harbor and sort of break up those waves. So that meant that following the shoreline, there's a lot of zigzagging that you do. But yeah, so at this point I've now seen, I think the entire Tommy Thompson shoreline. Aside from the part where the cormorants are because they really don't like people and I don't want to get too close to them. And I'm sure that the nature, conserva nature conservation authority appreciate that too, that you're sort of leaving the birds be and giving them their space. But anyways, here's the map of the Toronto waterfront and all the, all the coloring in that I did. You can see that I put a number of different uh, colors to represent different days. So there's a trail going off that way. I think I'll just stick with the main trail here, but maybe I'll come and look at that a little bit later because like I said, we're I'm a little bit concerned that this camera might shut off before I can make it to the end of the peninsula. to coyotes or eastern coyotes that live here on Tommy Thompson Park. There's also some foxes that live and apparently there's a, a family of foxes that call the end of the peninsula their home. I actually had the privilege of seeing one of those foxes when I was out riding my bike here one day. See, there's lots of big white caps out on the lake right now. Lots of white showing in the lake. Another trail leading off that way. But like I said, I'll continue with my original plan here. To get here to the park today, I took the Toronto Transit the TTC, which was quite straightforward. I took the subway to Dawnland Station, which is along the Danforth on the sort of east end of Toronto. And from there, I hopped on a bus, the number 83, which goes down Jones Avenue and terminates at Leslie Street and Commissioners, which is about a block north of the entrance to the park so I had a short walk and I was here and had my skis on and I was ready to explore. Yeah here we are pretty much at the end of the peninsula. You can see straight ahead there there's a trail which leads right up to the lighthouse but there's also a sort of a loop that you can do which goes around to the end. Yeah, actually, this, it feels like the wind is coming from the, the right side, so I guess I'll come over on this side because it should be a little bit more sheltered. And I'll, I will go all the way to the end of the peninsula. The lighthouse isn't much to see. It's a, a lighthouse that was built in the 1970s, I think. It's not an old historic lighthouse or anything like that. never a lighthouse that was, you know, operated by a person. Much more sheltered here. A nice cross-country ski track too.
And yeah, quite big waves out there. Would not be a great day to be out on my kayak, even if it was, a, even if the water was warm enough for that. I'm sure I'll be back here this year with my bike and hopefully I'll get a chance to make a video showing this same pathway by bicycle as well. I like to sort of show the contrast of the different seasons and different modes of transportation of places that you can visit. And yeah, so over here, this is a good chance to just sort of show you what what the, the spit is made out of. So there you can see some rebar with some rocks and concrete and bricks on it. And that's what you'll see if you were to kayak or travel around the outside of this. Lots of discarded construction materials. But, as they face the wind, I think this is probably a good place to wrap up the video. So I hope you enjoyed joining me on this cross country skiing adventure here today. If you watched all the way to the end of this video, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments section below. And thanks for watching.